Hello, this is Jim Kennard. Thanks for joining me. In order for you to understand and appreciate the uniqueness and importance of the Jacob R. Mitleider system of family gardening, you need to learn what influences and experience shaped his life, created his unique skills, motivations, and passions, and made it possible for him to do what no one else has ever done with family food production around the world. Let me take you on a visual journey as we look at the history of the Mitleider method. Jacob was born and raised on a farm in southeastern Idaho by faithful Seventh-day Adventists, and he remained a devout follower of that faith throughout his life. He did not like farming and vowed he would never be a farmer, so he attended high school at the Jim State Academy near Boise, Idaho, and learned the profession of baking. I have a lot to say about this slide, so please bear with me. In 1943, Jacob lost his job as a baker because he had a short temper and got into an argument with the manager of the store, and he walked out. Then he had to learn another profession. The only thing he knew about growing was what he learned as a boy on the farm, but he was desperate because he had a wife and two daughters, so he started learning how to grow flowers. He learned fast. He picked the brains of all the growers in the Imperial Valley of Southern California and hired the best soil lab on the West Coast, called the Matkin Lab, and put them on retainer. He managed to learn how to grow flowers and became highly successful and probably fairly wealthy. He trucked plants as far away as Louisiana, and he signed a contract with Sears to send a five-ounce packet of nine plants which he called Magic Myths, by flying Tiger Lines to Sears stores all over the country. Something happened, though, before he was able to get that in operation. The doctors took out half of his stomach because he had stomach ulcers from working 18 to 19 hours a day and living on four or five hours of sleep. The doctor announced to him that he was not going to live long unless he made some major changes in his life. Jacob made those changes. He got rid of the business and decided to devote whatever time the Lord would give him to helping others, giving back and teaching and blessing the lives of the people around the world. He was 43 years old at that time, and the Lord gave him another 43 years in which he devoted his life almost exclusively to blessing mankind. Jacob started in Milo, Oregon, by creating a big garden at an Adventist school there, and he grew in this greenhouse during the following winter. He grew corn, all kinds of vegetables, potatoes, and all of the greens. That was an amazing project. We still have growers today that were students of Jacob Mitleider back in those early days in Oregon. As a matter of fact, you may have heard me talk about Victoria Roth in Bend, Oregon. She worked as a young girl with Jacob Mitleider at the Milo Academy. Jacob then went to the people at Loma Linda University and told them that he thought it was senseless for people to be starving around the world when the God he worshiped would not provide an earth that could not feed the people. They basically told him to put his money where his mouth was. So he visited 24 countries over the course of six months and came back more sure than ever that there was no excuse for people starving. He said, they have land, sunlight, and water, and they waste all three. So the folks at Loma Linda sent him to one of the toughest places on planet Earth, a place called Papua New Guinea, where they were cannibals. The villages would fight with each other and the winners would eat the losers. It got so bad that as many as 90% of the people in the villages that were surviving the wars were dying of a terrible disease called Creutzfeldt jakob disease. We know it today as mad cow disease, and it is caused by cannibalism. 
The problem today and in the recent past is that our animal growers have been taking diseased and old and useless animals, grinding them up and putting them into the feed of the current generation of cows. There was such a terrible outbreak of mad cow disease in Britain that the world put a blockade on all British meat for two or three years to try and stop it. Pray you never get mad cow disease because it'll kill you in a most horrible way. This was one of Jacob's first experiences with the dangers of using animal byproducts. And he had many other experiences that taught him the same lesson. By the time he got there, these folks had stopped eating each other. At the point of a gun, the Australian military had stopped them. Here's what they were trying to live on. This was a row of sweet potatoes. Pathetic. At the High Elevation Hospital, it took 22 months for them to harvest a ton and a half per acre of sweet potatoes on this ground. Between nutrient deficiencies, diseases, and horrific weeds, these people were really, really struggling to feed themselves. As a matter of fact, the Adventist hospital and school on that island nation were about to be closed down because they couldn't grow enough food for their students. This is what their crops looked like. Here's their cabbage with terrible deficiencies and, of course, bug damage. Such a waste. Their sweet potatoes were skinny and there wasn't much nutrition in them. The school had to provide five pounds of sweet potatoes per day per student in order to have enough nutrition to stay reasonably healthy. By the way, as Jacob went around the world, he would see people who were starving and sick, and they would always have doctors and bush hospitals to take care of the people. But everywhere he went, he never saw anyone taking care of the plants. There were no plant doctors, and Jacob determined that's what he was going to do. See these men? They had changed from being fierce, scary-looking warriors to becoming gentlemen and educated and good. But they were still living on those pathetic sweet potatoes. Here's a different location, but with the same problem. Here, the garden doctor enters the scene, and he changes all that. He eliminates the weeds. He makes the garden a thing of beauty, and he starts to feed the plant. He begins by growing healthy seedlings. These propagated sweet potato seedlings are fed a complete natural mineral nutrient mix that gives the plants everything they need. Voila! Now you see beautiful, green, large, healthy plants. A magnificent, productive garden. Here we have a group of men with sweet potatoes so big they can only hold one or two in their arms. Here's Jacob Mitleider's wife, Mildred, and a boy and a girl holding monster-sized sweet potatoes. The boy's named Silas. He was Jacob's yard boy. Silas went on to finish school, work hard, get a career, and today he is known as His Excellency Sir Silas Atapare, President or Governor General of Papua New Guinea. That's not all that happened. Back in those days, there were hardly any Christians on the island nation. Today, over 10% of the population are Seventh-day Adventists. 25% of their parliament are Adventists. And people say the Adventists own Papua New Guinea in a good way. They have educated the people, given them health and longevity. These are wonderful, amazing things all because of the gardening Jacob Mitleider introduced and, of course, the labor and great work of many devoted Adventists who ran the school and the hospital. Here's the island of Fiji where Jacob went next, and the pictures look the same, just pathetic plants and weeds everywhere. When Mitleider got hold of it, this is what the garden looked like with tapioca growing neck 
high. It was an amazing transformation. Here is some taro or dallow. This is a root plant that people in the tropics live on. These are supposed to be 8 to 10 pounds each. But these are about 8 ounces each. And they were inflicted with scab disease. Jacob taught the people how to correct this by taking tiny cuttings and putting those cuttings into a clean, soilless mix medium, growing them, and feeding them proper mineral nutrients. This is the result after Dr. Mitleider grew clean plants in a healthy medium on the island of Fiji. There were tremendous changes. Those who paid attention, many of them became wealthy growers because Jacob showed them how. Next he went to Okinawa. This is an island that is now a part of Japan. The big city of Naha has more than a million people in it and they have no place to grow. Look at the forefront of the picture. You'll see something that looks like a box. Here you can see the start of what we call a grow box garden. That garden became a thing of beauty and productivity right in the middle of the city on a big parking lot. Another problem the people of Okinawa have is steep mountainsides and a lot of cyclones. As many as 86 cyclones a year whistle down through those steep hillsides. The people couldn't grow anything. Jacob hired a bulldozer, bulldozed those mountains and terraced them and once again installed grow boxes, as he called them, or containers with open bottoms. Here you can see the result of one of Jacob Mitleider's grow box gardens in Okinawa. Notice in the background, you'll see a vertical structure like a fence, which is a windbreak. They were testing different things to see what could reduce the wind so they could grow in spite of the cyclones that came whistling through. He did such amazing things that General Lampert, the ruling authority, and other dignitaries, including the Japanese ambassador, came and saw what Dr. Mitleider was doing and gave him great high praise. Since that time, the people of Okinawa, with his help, have learned to grow in greenhouses, have learned to grow on their steep mountainsides, and have learned to grow even in their cities in boxes on whatever they have, their flat roofs, their patios, their driveways. Jacob next conducted projects in four countries in Africa. A large rock outcropping is called a kopi. Around the edges of the kopi, you would have sand accumulating. The wind would wear away the stone. And of course, you have leaves that would fall off the trees. He was able to use what he called kopi soil to grow his seedlings in. A lot of times he couldn't find sawdust or typical regular sand. So they learned to use kopi soil. It was clean and it did not have weeds, bugs, or diseases. Forest mulch in this country can be used the same way. He established a training project at a school called Salusi in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. And this is the way he grew at this location. Because of the dry climate, it's a little different growing procedures than he employed in Papua New Guinea. There were some similarities to Fiji and some things a little different. These were five foot wide beds, level with ridges to hold the water. And he would fill those with plants. Let's see what he did in Zimbabwe. Again, he started teaching them how to grow their own seedlings. That is always the best procedure to teach people to grow their own seedlings so they're not dependent on the grid, on other or outside influences, and they can grow healthy seedlings fast when they need them. Look at the garden in the background. What an amazing garden that turned out to be. Here you see a man watering the garden. The hose was a luxury. In students' home gardens, they hauled buckets, sometimes long distances. 
In addition to the wide beds, they had narrow beds, and they grew vertically in those narrow beds. In this picture, you can see cucumbers that are seven feet tall. If you look closely, you can see cucumbers in there. Those cucumbers are grown in one row, six inches apart. Isn't that amazing? They obviously did some pruning. He taught the people pruning and sucker removal. Here you see tomato plants that were grown vertically also in one row, eight inches apart. Such tremendous yield, nothing like that had been seen before. Next you see a book called Let's Grow Tomatoes. Remember that Jacob started out as a baker. He did everything according to the recipe. He documented everything he did, and he was always experimenting and trying to improve. When he made improvements, he documented that. And when he wasn't out in the world blessing people's lives directly, he was home in his little place in Salt Lake City writing books. By the way, he moved from Loma Linda to Salt Lake City in response to the pleas for help from the folks in Utah who were so interested in gardening that they kept Jacob busy any time he was in the country doing seminars and helping them with their gardening. He ended up living about a mile from me, and that is how I became acquainted with the great garden doctor. He wrote Let's Grow Tomatoes about this time, and it's a great book. It's not available in print anymore, regrettably, and you may pay a lot of money for it if you buy it used on Amazon.com. You can buy it, however, from the website www.growfood.com as a digital download and as a part of the Mitlider Gardening Library on CD. This book will teach you how to grow tomatoes and other vertically grown crops. This picture shows almost solid plants. The eyes are so narrow you can hardly walk down them. And he's just growing brassicas and greens here. If you were growing larger plants, you'd have no room to walk at all. Jacob learned from this to have wider aisles. And these are some of the kind of success stories that Jacob created in all four countries in which he conducted projects in Africa. Of course, everywhere in Africa, they had to fence their gardens to keep the marauding animals out. The people there were so happy to have healthy food. As I said earlier, when Jacob first started going around the world, remember he went to 24 countries, he came back and said they had doctors for the people, but no doctors for the plants. Jacob became the plant doctor, and he literally changed millions of lives. One of the students from the classes Dr. Mitleider taught in Africa over the course of two years included John. This was John's garden before he came to the Mitlighter class. And this is John's garden as a Mitlighter grower. It was like day and night. As a matter of fact, John, before his Mitlighter training, would be lucky to see $20 per year in cash. It was a barter economy. You grow your own, then trade with your neighbors. Everybody was suffering. You did the best you could. In six months after John went home from the class, he grew and sold $575 cash crops and still was in the middle of his growing season when Mitlider visited him. So this changed the world for John. Take a look at these tomatoes. They're so pathetic diseased and hardly alive. Good luck trying to live on those. Now look at what's close by. This is Lawrence. The previous tomatoes belonged to Lawrence's father, who was growing tomatoes according to the method they'd always used, which was the best of organics that they could get, manure and compost. His father's tomatoes were disease-ridden, and basically dying and dead after just a few weeks. 
Lawrence grew his tomatoes until they were seven feet high, and then they started coming back down and grew back to the ground. They grew for basically a whole year with no diseases. Why? Because the plants were healthy, well-fed, and disease-resistant. That's it with humans, too. If you have a healthy diet, especially if you have a whole food, plant-based diet, you and your body will resist disease and you'll stay healthy, like these gardens did. This is Jerry's garden after the Mitlider training program in Tanzania. It's still early in the growing season. The plants are still relatively small, but beautiful, uniform, healthy, and growing like crazy. This is also Tanzania, a neighboring country to Zimbabwe, and Jacob did the same thing here with magnificent gardens everywhere he worked. Jacob always taught the people how to grow by feeding their plants accurately with a balanced nutrient mix that included all 13 nutrients the plants need that man and the soil can supply. About this time, he wrote the book Mitlighter Growbox Gardens. This is another treasure. It talks specifically about growing in containers or grow boxes, and it is not available in paper, but it is included as a digital download on the Food for Everyone website, and it's also a part of the Mitlighter Gardening Library. These can all be had at www.growfood.com. If you like to grow in containers or need to grow in containers because you have bad ground or you have no ground or you only have a patio or flat roof or a driveway, get this book. It's a great resource. Midlighter next went to Mount Hope, British Columbia in Canada. You see the mountain rising up immediately behind this place. This was a difficult place to grow, and the people were having a hard time. This was another Adventist school, and Jacob immediately turned it into a gardening mecca with tons and tons of good, healthy food for these students. Understand that the students, so many of them, are strictly vegetarian, and so these students were dependent on this plant supply for their food. Jacob did an amazing job there. As always, he taught them how to grow healthy seedlings. This gives you a big head start, a four to six week head start. You don't lose plants to cold soil or diseases or bugs. You have 100% healthy plants going into your garden and they grow fast and you have them in the garden a shorter time. So you get them out, harvested, before diseases or bugs can hurt them. He also showed them how to grow inside a greenhouse, and he was growing these tomatoes to maturity right there in the greenhouse. Milo, Oregon was where he did the first greenhouse project, and he learned a lot about growing vegetables in a greenhouse, even in the winter. He also introduced something different there. He grew in narrow raised beds right in the soil, and this is what we mostly use today. He determined that this was the best of all worlds, 18 inch wide soil beds that were raised and level with ridges. And you see the students transplanting into those beds here. Look at the tomatoes growing. In this case, he used stakes rather than strings and tea frames that we recommend today. The next country we'll talk about is Trinidad. By the way, Dr. Mitleider visited 27 countries over 37 years. He did 75 major gardening projects like I'm describing. He changed the course of history in some of those countries and blessed the lives of millions of people. The Trinidad Island is just off the coast of South America. They have this massive lake of asphalt, and it provides money for the government. 
By the time Jacob was asked to come there, people were really struggling. And they were importing food because they couldn't grow food in this terrible soil. The soil there is called caliche. It is hard, miserable, very cloddy, with little nutrition in it. This is, of course, close to sea level. And I think it was actually a coral-based soil. That's why it's kind of orange and pink. Let's look at what Jacob did. First, he taught them how to grow healthy seedlings. Notice these seedlings are off the ground and on tables. That is always critical so that you get away from the diseases and the pests. And then, voila, magnificent gardens. He introduced something different here than we have seen previously. We have what is called a tea frame with arched PVC pipe on it and greenhouse plastic over it. It was used there in Trinidad and we use it in Popayan, Colombia to protect the plants from driving torrential rains. In some places like Arizona, Texas and Mexico, it's used with shade cloths to protect those same plants from the terrible heat of 115 to 120 degree temperatures. This is a great thing for you to use. Notice the plants here. They're beautiful, close together with uniform growth. Now here is a picture of my in the garden greenhouse that has the plastic coming all the way down the sides and the end. This will allow you in a temperate climate to grow your tomatoes and other vining warm weather crops clear until November and December. There are many benefits of a tea frame with the arched PVC over the top and greenhouse plastic. First introduced in Trinidad and Tobago about 30 years ago. Dr. Mitleider documented many years of learning in this great 250 page book with hundreds of pictures like you've just seen. This is not available in paper copy, but on the website you can get it as a digital download or as part of the Mitleider Gardening Library CD. This was the book I used to create a half acre garden at Utah's Hogel Zoo. And I had that garden for almost 20 years. I wore out more than one grow bed gardening book because I always had it in the garden with me. Jacob was next invited to go to communist Russia. Back in 1989, Mr. Gorbachev created something called glasnost in perestroika, which basically opened up Russia to the rest of the world. They allowed the Adventists to open a small college if Jacob would create an agriculture program. He did. They gave him a little dacha that was a mess. And he turned it very quickly into a magnificent garden. The communist agricultural agents would come into his garden about this time and steal his plants. They'd stick them under their jackets and take them to their labs for testing. This went on for a month or so. And finally, they approached him and said, you've got to tell us what you're doing here. We've never seen such beautiful, green, healthy plants. He was able to teach them proper care and feeding of plants, and they ended up sending students from their most prestigious ag school, Timurazi Academy, to his three-month program. We would hear those students, after they graduated from the three-month class, say, I learned more about growing food in three months than I did in five years at the university. These are just a few of the things that Jacob did in Russia. He was there at a very important time. I believe God sent him there because in the two and a half years between when he got there and when communism fell, Jacob was able to help millions of people learn how to grow food. You see, Stalin killed 13 million of his people, collectivized the farms, and put the people into factories. And Russia became an importing country because they couldn't grow enough food for themselves. 
Finally, when communism was overthrown, Jacob had taught enough people that they had the courage not to go back to communism. In 1993, I was in Moscow on the day that communists tried to take over the government again, and it did not happen. I believe as much as anything, it was because God sent two groups of people there. First, Jacob with his knowledge of food production, and second, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir with the knowledge of Christianity and the testimony of the Brotherhood of Man. I was in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir in 1991 and had the great blessing six weeks before the fall of communism of spending two weeks in Russia and for the first time ever Christian programming was broadcast nationwide on their government TV stations and the Russian people heard about God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Brotherhood of Man in their own language from their friends and neighbors from America. I personally believe that those two things were material influences in getting communism to fall and keeping it from coming back. You see the first Sayoksi Russia greenhouse in this picture. This is a typical Mitlider greenhouse with what is called a continuous ventilator across the top. We do those all over the world because people don't have electricity and fans and that section at the top opens up. And heat rises, of course, so the airflow allows the hot air to go out and cool the building. The sides roll up also. So between the sides rolling up and the top letting heat out, this is a great greenhouse. The Adventist College in Russia ended up with about 117 acres of ground. Over the course of the last 25 years, they have taught over a thousand students. Folks, there are tens of millions of people whose lives have been impacted directly by this gardening method. I've been told by students who graduated that some of them have gone on and have had themselves as many as 50,000 people in their influence growing gardens this way. They tell me that the Mitlider method is the most productive and most popular method of growing in many regions of the Commonwealth countries of Russia. Talk about changing people's lives. I believe this humble man did more than giant armies could do in doing good. I bless him every day for the opportunity I have of following in his footsteps in a small way. To give you more of an idea of the dramatic changes Jacob brought to Russia, in this picture you see zucchini on the left and beans on the right. When Jacob arrived in 1989, most people there were growing only four things. They had food under communism, but it consisted of borscht. Their borscht had cabbage and beets and potatoes, and if they were lucky, they might get a carrot. The first year Jacob was there, he grew 16 different vegetables. By the time he stopped going over there during the growing season seven years later, they were growing 23 major types of vegetables in Zayoksky, Russia. This is at 54 degrees north latitude. That's the equivalent of Alaska. This picture is a Zayoksky graduate's personal garden. Here's another book called Gardening by the Foot, which Dr. Mittleiter wrote about that time. It's also an excellent book with hundreds of pictures and instructions on growing in containers. The cover picture is of a Russian garden. He also wrote a three volume set called The Garden Doctor. This is an absolute treasure that teaches and illustrates nutrient deficiencies and corrective treatments for all 13 nutrients plants require. That plus the gardens he did and the students he taught 
convinced the Russian Communist government to honor an American, probably the first ever. They made him the featured speaker at the Yalta Conference of Agriculture Ministers, and they praised his name. The Communist Agriculture Minister said on their national television, quote, the only food grown in Russia that's fit to eat is grown in a Mitleider garden, close quote. I've had the privilege since 1998 of carrying on Dr. Mitleider's work. We've created a website, digitized all of the books and training materials, and conducted numerous month-long humanitarian training projects in countries including Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, Madagascar, and Colombia. We also conduct free group gardening seminars around the United States. In 2004, I was invited to go to Armenia by a retired agriculture professor who was living there. He wanted me to help them with an ambitious garden training project. So I went over there, and my translator was a young woman by the name of Araxia Gavorgian. This is Araxia's mother, Tamara. At that time, Tamara knew nothing about gardening, nothing. She was a city girl born and bred and had never grown a garden. I was there that spring and she saw some of the things we were doing. My first wife died that summer. Later that summer, I invited Miss Gaborgan to America and in a weak moment, she agreed to marry me. Since then, we've been back to Armenia many times and we have taught her mother how to grow. She's become our representative in Armenia. We have a large garden, a training facility, and a greenhouse, and Tamara grows there. By the way, that's a 20-pound cabbage. She's also grown many other things, including potatoes. The potatoes on the right are purple potatoes, and Tamara did not grow those from other potatoes. The normal way in America and most places around the world is to propagate them by cutting up potatoes and planting those. Here, Tamara used actual seed. We taught her how to use true potato seeds, and she grew a fabulous crop of wonderful purple tomatoes. That was several years ago, and she's still able to use those same potatoes as seed potatoes. If you want to learn how to grow potatoes, just talk to the folks at the growfood.com and we'll teach you some things. A few years ago, we started and conducted a school of agronomy in the capital city of Antananarivo, Madagascar. A short video of that great experience can be seen at the link shown or purchased at www.growfood.com shop. More recently, we were invited to go to a place called Popayan, Colombia, in South America, by a world-famous doctor, Dr. Alfonso Tenorio. He was lecturing around the world, teaching the truth that people were dying from tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, and leprosy unnecessarily, because they were weak from poor nutrition. Sound familiar? Dr. Tenorio's major effort was to try and spread that knowledge throughout the world. When he discovered the Mitleider method of growing, he got us to come to Colombia, and we taught on the university campus for four months. He was thrilled with the kind of gardens that we created there. That particular state of the Colombian nation, called Cauca, was the poorest state for the children's nutrition in the entire country. We were there to try and help show those people how they could turn that around and get nutrition into their children. The university agriculture professors proved to themselves the tremendous difference proper feeding makes by comparing the Mitleider weekly feed with the 16-16-16 
and an organic mix that they were using and teaching. The garden doctor's work goes on, and it is corroborated today by the best doctors in the world who say and who prove that healthy food makes healthy people. And healthy plants are the best source of good food for human beings. The 10 digitized Midlighter gardening books, along with nine subject-specific manuals, have become known as the Midlighter Gardening Library. The CD is searchable, so you can type in a word or phrase, and everywhere it appears in any of the books, it will pop up. All of the Midlighter materials are available at www.growfood.com slash shop. And this picture illustrates what you can do in your own backyard. These are some folks in southeastern Idaho, and they wanted to try the boxes. They have a fabulous garden, as you can see. They grow virtually everything, and they feed their family out of that small garden. See the little girl in the background there? She's now a bigger girl and growing her own lighter garden. Wonderful people. I'll finish this presentation on the history of the Mitleiter gardening method and his legacy to the world with the recommendation that the one book that you need and want is the Mitleiter gardening course. Remember, he was a baker. He was always following the recipe, but improving whenever possible. And he would document those improvements as he went along. The final book, Jacob's final offering to the world, was the Mitleider Gardening Course, first published in 1998, just before he retired and turned everything over to me. We have subsequently edited, revised, and updated the book, and the most recent publication was January of 2015. Thank you.